Hello, everybody. Um, this is I, Dana Goldberg. I am really honored to be a board member uh, for JOFA and to be introducing tonight's webinar uh, for all of us. You have Dr. Carmel Abraham's bio in front of you, so I'm not going to spend too much time reading through uh, her extensive experience um, in so many different areas, because I know we have a lot that we want to cover tonight. Um, but I just would say that Carmela is uh, uh, earned her bachelor's degree from Barnard and is a uh, physician who has practiced, who has worked in research, um, and continues to work in the medical field, and she has also taken on um, the study, uh, full-time, sort of part-time study at Yeshivat Mahara. You know, I'm proud and honored to call her my friend here in our White Plains community, and I am in tremendous awe of her dedication to uh, bringing on Yeshiv her work at Yeshivat Mahara and all that she does in our community for women's fila and for the community as a whole. So I think we're all in for a treat tonight when we to spend the next hour or so with Carmela as she walks us through the halachot of women and shofar. Mm -hmm. You'll note that all of you are in listen-only <coughs> mode, which means that we cannot hear you, but you can hear us. Um, if you have any questions, please, you'll note that on the side of your screen, there is a questions uh, tab. And there's a chat tab, and you can put the uh, put your questions into either the questions or the chat. Uh, to the woman who asked about the bio slide, the bio slide actually isn't up. It's on the registration that was sent to you. So you can go back and take a look at her full bio at another point. Um, so you can put your questions into that chat. Carmel is going to stop over the course of her presentation. Um, at which time I will take a look at that you are sent with us on that. Um, but we do intend and hope to get to a lot of material this evening and also have a chance to answer all of your questions. So um, without kind of further ado, I want to introduce my friend um, and our webinar presenter for this evening, Dr. And to Jofa for sponsoring this evening. Um, I am a student at Yeshivat Maharat. I'm a third year part time student. Um, and the discussion we'll be having tonight will focus on women and the laws of shofar. Uh, the source sheet uh, is actually available to you. You can see it. Uh, there might be a time lag, and it should you should have it available as well for you to download and, and walk through with me. Um, a lot of this, all of this is actually based on an article written by a colleague and friend of mine, Alyssa Thomas Newborn, uh, that is actually been uh, sent to everybody in the Jofa Journal and has been sent out online, A Cry from the Soul, Women and Helfot Shafar. And um, Basically, I'll be outlining much of what she's covered in uh, this publication um, and, uh, to, and briefly uh, review the laws that are related to women and blowing shofar. Um, tonight, we're going to tackle the following questions. Can a woman blow shofar for, a me for men or a man on Rosh Hashanah in Shul? Uh, can a woman, or at all, can a woman blow for other women? Can a woman make a blessing for the shofar? And can a woman blow shofar in a lull? It is customary uh, for communities to have a shofar blowing after the morning prayer service, after shacharit. Um, and so can a woman blow in that context? Um, I will pause intermittently, as Idana said, throughout this uh, discussion um, and ask certain questions or see if you have any questions and I will try to answer them as best as I can. Okay, so with that we'll begin. Um, so most Orthodox women, if you ask them about uh, shofar blowing and their obligation, they will tell you, of course I'm obligated in blowing shofar, I make sure I'm there, um, and, I may, and I say amen to that blessing. 
Um, so, you know, some of these questions that I've asked seem, well, Carmela, of course, uh, women go to uh, Shul and we are uh, listening to Shofar, so we do have an obligation and we do make a bracha. Uh, but in actuality, um, women are not obligated uh, to blow Shofar by the Torah. And where we are now uh, is very different than where uh, the laws uh, for women started out. Um, and so to better understand how we got to this point, how we got to this point of where on a communal level women feel obligated to blow shofar and, and have taken this obligation on, uh, we need to um, go back and start at the beginning of the commandment itself and look very closely at it. Uh, that will help us determine the answers to the questions that I've outlined um, in the beginning about whether women can blow for men, women for other women, et cetera, et cetera. So the first question that we need to answer is why do we blow shofar? And in the simplest answer, um, and often when I present this question, I get all sorts of uh, uh, nice reasons, but the reason the actual reason we blow shofar is because the Torah commanded us. And actually, I'm going to use uh, our sources right now. I'm going to go to source um, 7 and 8 on the document, uh, 6, 7, and 8. And I will be, I'll be, use it, I'll be reading it in English uh, for time uh, to make it easier. But if you look at the, source, the sources that are provided, source 7 and 8, very clear, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, it will be a Sabbath for you, a remembrance through the true uh, a holy convocation. Okay, seventh, the seventh month being Tishrei, so that first day of Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah. And this, the, the source eight, and the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall not do any work, it will be a day of true ah for you. Okay, so here are our sources. If you note, and I'm not going to go into this too uh, too much, but um, there are so here are our sources for Rosh Hashanah, but they don't even mention the word shofar in them. And it actually, we learn shofar from a third source, which is source number six. Then you will proclaim with the true of the shofar on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, you will proclaim with the shofar throughout all your land. This reference is to the year of Jubilees, or Yovel, when all of the slaves go free, when the land goes back to its original owners. Uh, on Yom Kippur, the shofar is blasted. Um, the rabbis learn in, in the Gemara, in Rosh Hashanah, uh, page you know, 33, um, Amud Bet, the second, the second side, that we learn from this pasuk that uh, throughout the entire month of Tishrei, uh, including Rosh Hashanah, we're supposed to blow shofar. So on Rosh Hashanah, they learn that we're supposed to blow shofar. That's where we get, that's how we learn it. Well, so now we know from the Torah that we're supposed to blow shofar, but let's look at it on another level. What kind of mitzvah is this? Let's look at source number 12. And when I say that, there are categories of mitzvot. There are positive commandments, and their negative commandments. So right away, the Rambam tells us, and it doesn't, it's not, uh, it's ab absolutely very clear, right? Mitzvah asay shel Torah l'shmoa truah to shofar b'rosh hashanah sh'nemar yom truah yelechem. It is a positive commandment from the Torah to hear the sounds of the shofar and rosh hashanah as it is said, and we quote from one of the psukim that I presented, a day of blowing will be for you. So we know it's a positive commandment. Um, but moreover, it also fits into another category. It's a positive commandment that is a time-bound commandment, which means that if you do not perform this commandment in the time allotted or in the designated time or day or specific context of time, uh, you cannot fulfill it. Uh, and examples of other time-bound commandments uh, that we all perform are lulav, uh, sitting in the sukkah. Um, some of us, some of us, um, we all do kriyat shema, um, tzitzit and tefillin, uh, depending on you know 
most that's what men do, um, but there are some women who have taken that on. Uh, those are examples of time-bound commandments. So right now, what we know, shofar, Torah commanded, positive commandment, time-bound. But what do we know about time-bound commandments and women? So let's look at source 10. Masacha Kiddushin, 29a. And I want to sort of skip down to the fourth line in that uh, source. All time-bound commandments men are obligated in and women are exempt from. And all commandments that are not time-bound men and women are obligated in equally. Let's stop there. So what do we know? All time-bound commandments men are obligated but women are exempt. They are not required to perform it. If we look at source number nine, which is right above source 10, um, let's understand what that means. Um, let's look at the uh, fourth line in that source. A person who is not obligated to perform a religious duty cannot perform that duty to fulfill the obligation of others. So right away, we see, and we can make, this makes, you know, if we follow this along, this is a time-bound commandment. Women are exempt from time-bound commandments, and because they're exempt from time-bound commandments, they cannot perform, they cannot blow shofar, for example, perform a religious duty for someone who is obligated. So therefore, in, res in the response to the first question of whether women can blow shofar for men, women who are not obligated can blow shofar for men who are obligated in the mitzvah of shofar, the answer is no, they cannot. Um, and of course, if we look at source 13, the Rambam confirms this in his Mishnah Torah. Any person who's not obligated in a commandment cannot fulfill the obligation of another. Therefore, if a woman or a child who are not equally obligated as a man in the mitzvah shofar blows a shofar, a man who hears her blowing will not have fulfilled his obligation. So that's pretty clear. So then, how did we get to the point of where women uh, feel obligated or communally, the communal obligation of women to go and listen to shofar? Let's look at source 14, the Sefer Maharil. This is Yaakov ben Moshe Levi. He's a Rishon um, who lived uh, in the 14th century. And he writes, everyone is obligated in shofar, whether they are children or adults. Indeed, women are exempt from time bound commandments, but they have accepted upon themselves the obligation. Interesting. And all adult women and young women intend to be in shul to hear the tefillah and the blast from the beginning until the end. And this is our practice today. So what we have here is that women as a community, as a group, accepted this mitzvah upon themselves. Now, this is not the same <clears throat> as a biblical obligation. And yet, we see that he writes, women intend to be at shul for the entire shofar blowing, right? So from the minute, from after Kriyat Torah, through Musaf, through the end, women intend to be in shul for, now again, the assumption here being for all of those shofar blasts, which are a hundred blasts. I want to actually take a moment right now to ask everybody online as to why they think uh, women accepted it upon themselves to do this mitzvah. What about shofar um, and this mitzvah um, appealed to them or felt that they were going, that they, you know, felt that they should obligate themselves in it? So women, um, I have a question. Are there other mitzvot women accepted upon themselves to do? Women accepted sukkah and lulav as well. So there are other mitzvot that women accepted upon themselves to do. So 
So do we have any thoughts as to why um, women may have accepted this mitzvah upon themselves? Maybe I should see if there are questions or... Ah, okay, so I have one answer. It was the core point of the holiday. What is the core point of the holiday? Oh, since it's called Yom Chu'ah. Okay, all right. So they wanted to be part, they felt that Shofar was so central to Rosh Hashanah because it is the commandment Yom Chu'ah, that that might be a reason. Thank you. Another Ah, I have an, another nice answer. Ah, I have a couple great answers here. So one answer uh, is that women were less exposed to Jewish liturgy. The visceral sound of the shofar was something they could relate to, even if the other prayers were not as reliable. Um, and so, you know, this was an answer I heard this weekend, and I'm glad it's being shared again. Uh, if women weren't familiar in ancient times with the liturgy, uh, they could relate to the shofar uh, just by listening to it. this nonverbal uh, cry, so to speak, um, that really reflected some primal worries, concerns. I have another answer here, which was brought right away. It's because of Sisra's mother's cries being a source for shofar. And this is wonderful because this actually helps me take everybody to um, the first page of our source of our sources. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm getting great. In one audible and physical act, they can feel more connected to the spiritual aspect of the holiday. This is beautiful. I'm getting such great answers uh, from from somebody who's online. Um, so thank you, thank you for for one of our from our one of our participants. So I want to actually talk about how. Women are echoed throughout uh, Rosh Hashanah. And in fact, if you look at um, the second source, Masechet Rosh Hashanah, there's a whole argument and dispute about what the actual sound of Truah is. Okay, so let's go back. When we're blowing Shofar, it's Tikiyah, Truah, Tikiyah. But in actuality, it is Tikiyah, Shvarim truah tkiya tkiya shvarim truah. I'm sorry, tkiya shvarim tkiya tkiya truah tkiya. How did this come about? And this uh, Gemara deals with that question. So there is an actual dispute as to what truah was supposed to be. The length of the truah is equal to the length of three yavavot. But has it not been taught the length of the truah is equal to three shvarim? So what is Trua? Is Trua Yivava or is Trua Shvarim? Abaye said, here there's really a difference of opinion. It is written, it, should, it shall be a day of Trua for you. And it is written of the mother of Sisra through the, win, through the window. Sisra's mother peered and sobbed. Batitya Beb. We actually have the source for it uh, in number one. One authority thought that this means drawing a long sigh the one that holds that truah is equal to three shvarim, and the other that it means uttering short piercing cries, the one that holds that truah is equal to three yavavot. So here's the dispute. Which is it? Is it a long sigh, which is shvarim, or is it short piercing cries, sobbing? And they base this on the mother of Sisra. Let's go back to the story of Devorah and Barak who are fighting Sisera, the general, and Yavin. And he, of course, is a famous story of Yael who kills Sisera. She gives him milk, she puts him to sleep, and she drives a peg through his head. And then Devorah sings of the glories of this war. Um, and at the end of her song, she describes, and we have it in source one, through the window, sister's mother peered. Through the lattice, she sobbed. Why is his chariot taking so long? Why is he delayed? She says some other things. It's striking that the mother of our enemy is used to determine the sound of truan. In fact, because we don't know whether it's a shvarim, a sort of long sigh or 
R Ramon versus Yevava, which is a piercing cry, we do both. Um, and in fact, if you look at source number three, Sisra's mother also becomes the source of the number of cries that are made. Uh, number three, Sister's mother cried 100 cries and we hold over 10. When we complete all our personal prayers and the 90 sharper blows sounded during them, we must add a final 10. And this comes to a total of 100 blows like Sister's mother. So she certainly figures in to not just the definition of chua, but the number of sounds that we need to make on that day that are required. Another source gives... Uh, from the Midrash Vayikra Rabbah. Vikra Rabbah is actually dated to the, it's, a, it's dated to the times of the Mishnah. Uh, so it's a, one of our oldest sources of Midrash. A woman cries a hundred cries at the times when she gives birth, 99 of death and one of life. That's source number four. And the following source, Meshe Chachma, explains this. The 100 blasts of the Shofar and Rosh Hashanah are hinted at. Through the words brought in Midrash Tanchuma on Parsha Tezria, section four, it says there, woman's cry, a woman cries, 100 cries, when she gives birth, 99 for death and one for life. The day the world was born and, and the world was all that fills it are similarly born. Whether for compassion or judgment, so we sound 100 blasts. So here's an alternative view. The alternative view is that those 100 blasts come from childbirth and the pain and, the, and what goes through, what women went through then in terms of labor of 99 shouts for death and one shout for life, you know, when the baby is born. Um, and of course, it refers to the, the, the words that we use at Rosh Hashanah and the davening after we blow Shafar, Hayom Harat Alam, today the world was born. Um, so I... You know, so that's an alternative view and certainly very focused on, on women. And there's a, fi a final view that is not in our source sheet. Um, and we have to remember that our matriarch, Sarah, uh, it figures this is her holiday. We talk, Isaac was born on Rosh Hashanah and we read Hashem Pekat Sarah and the Torah laning. Um, we, we read about his birth. Um, and in fact, when you look at the Midrash about Sarah, about how she died, she died after she heard about the Akedah, and the Midrash says that she cried a hundred cries like a shofar and then died. So we have the mother of Sisra, we have Sarah, we have um, this, this bigger idea of women giving birth as uh, um, uh, as sources for our hundred blasts. So it asks, it sort of brings us back to the question and it's almost why, you know, why did women take on, um, you know, the mitzvah of shofar? Um, and, uh, you know, and let me, let me, you know, I would like to hear what people think about it the answers to that, and if you have any reactions to what I've presented to you at this point. Oh, I don't see questions. I see chat. Sorry. Saying. Any reactions? Any ideas? Would this help add to why women took this mitzvah upon themselves? So I just wanted to add, oh, okay, no questions, okay. Um, so I just wanted to give a thought that I heard today that I thought was absolutely beautiful uh, because we did present this at a wonderful um, uh, teaching of how to, a workshop on how to uh, blow chauffeur. Um, and then I, we taught the um, Mikarot again. And one woman said, if you pull all of these three together, it's really about life. It's about losing people in your life. It's about um, bringing people into the world. Um, it's about a woman's life. And so therefore, uh, of course, they would want to own this mitzvah uh, because Shofar was so central um, and sort of listening to it and hearing it helps you recall a lot of what of the pain and the, and the, and, and the suffering that you might have been through 
over the course of the year. So that might be another reason why women wanted to own this. Okay, so women wouldn't have known the sources at that time because women were illiterate is what I'm getting as a question. Absolutely, they may not have known the sources, but I suspect they knew the stories. These were stories of the matriarchs, specifically Sarah's story. They knew the stories of war. They heard them. Um, I, there's obviously no proof. It's just um, an imagining or as we think through these things, obviously um, we don't have records of what was said at that time, but it's something that we should consider. Um, okay. So having said that, um, so women take on this mitzvah. And let's look further at the idea of women blowing for other women. Um, let's go to number source number 15. This is Rav Yosef Karo and the Beit Yosef. And if we look at source 15 and we scroll down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines, therefore, if women want to do a time bound command, the volition lies in their hands, and we do not worry about the prohibition of adding to the law nor about the blowing. And if we continue, just skip down to the end where he says, Rabbeinu Tam ruled, and all our rabbis after him, like Rav Yossi, and to blow shofar for themselves, women, is similar to laying hands, which is permitted because of nachat ruach. So he brings up this concept of a smicha, that just as women were allowed in the times of the Beit HaMikdash, if they wanted to, to do smicha, putting their hands, laying their hands on a korban, which men were required to do, they women weren't obligated, but just as they were allowed to do that, women can blow shofar should be able to blow shofar because of nachat ruach, because of peace of spirit. And in fact, the Shulchan Ar Yosef Karo, again in the Shulchan Aruch, followed up in the next source, and it's number six in the next source, source 16, number six. Afal pisha nashim p'turot yecholot litkawa. Okay, so even though they're p'turot, they can certainly blow shofar. And the Mishnah Brura in Source 18 says, very interesting, um, and should you think that they wouldn't get a schar for even doing that, don't think that. On the contrary, about six lines down, since he who is not commanded and does also receives a reward. Very interesting. And I wanted to say, if you look at the last line, what, is, what does he say? Women have a partial obligation in the blowing of a shofar. So, in fact, you start to see the Mishnah Brura, um, not quite, it's not a biblical commandment. It's not an obligatory commandment. It's a partial obligation. So, um, we start to see that um, the uh, poskim are sort of, giving support to women doing this uh, mitzvah. So going back to our question about whether women can blow for other women, we see from the sources that women can certainly blow for other women at Rosh Hashanah. So what could that look like? Women can't blow for men at Rosh Hashanah, but certainly um, they can blow for other women. So on Rosh Hashanah, there are women who are hospitalized. There are women who did not make it to Shul. Elderly parents, elderly um, women who couldn't walk to Shul that day, they may have gotten sick. Um, women coming late. Um, there are plenty of opportunities available for women to blow for other women. Um, so I think that that is a very, a very nice thing um, that can be done. It's been done. It's been done in our community here in White Plains, where we have a woman accompany the rabbi, and she goes into uh, the various rooms for uh, for ill women, and and she blows for them. The third question that um, uh, that follows from this is, well, okay, so women can blow for other women, but can they make a bracha? And Really, the question um, has to be asked because when bracha, 
We're saying, Baruch Atah Hashem, Lekeinu Melech Olam, Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotav, B'Mitzvotav, V'Tzivanu. V'Tzivanu means commanded. And as I said from the start, women are not commanded in um, Shofar. So how could they say the bracha? And um, our post can deal with this question. And really the split, believe it or not, is between uh, the uh, Ashkenazim and the Sephardim on this. So if you look back at um, source 15, our Beit Yosef, and if we go uh, further down, so it's about two, four, six, eight, about 10 lines down, so too said the Rosh in the name of Rabbeinu Tom, as it is said there in his name, that they women are able to bless on time-bound commandments even though they are exempt. Okay? Um, and in fact, if you go to the next, um, the next source, source number 16, the Ramah, and the practice is that women bless on time-bound commandments. So to hear for Shofar, they should bless for themselves. But others, men, should not bless for them if they have already fulfilled their obligation and they men are only blowing for women. But if they, are, if they men are blowing for a man who's obligated, they, men, bless for him even though they, men, already fulfill their obligation. Okay, so what does this mean? A woman can bless for herself for, um, uh, for blowing shofar. Um, if a man has made the bracha in shul and he goes to a woman's home, his own home, to, to do it for his mother, his mother, or whoever elderly women that are there, or any women that are there that could make it to Shul, they will make their own bracha. He cannot make a bracha for them. If another man is there, then he can make the bracha for them. At the end of the day, as per the Ramah, based on um, Rabbeinu Tam, women can make brachot on mitzvot asay shehazman Ramah. Well, let's look back at the Shulchan Aruch. And the Shulchan Aruch bases this on the Rambam. If we go back in this same source, number six, even though women are exempt from Shofar, they're able to blow. So to a man, after he's fulfilled his obligation already, is able to blow Shofar for the woman to fulfill their obligation. But they, the women, should not bless, and they, the men, should not bless for them. So the Shulchan Aruch holds, and um, pretty much the Sephardim hold by this, is that uh, women do not make this bracha on time-bound mitzvot. Um, any questions? I'm, I'm uh, sort of moving on at a quick pace. I didn't want, if there are any questions, if anybody has them, they can just certainly send them to me. Carmelo, um, I have a question that came up, which I think is an important right. one to clarify. Uh, the question is, is the mitzvah to hear shofar or to blow shofar? And thus, if the obligation is to hear shofar, then why would it matter whether a man or a woman does the blowing of the shofar? I think okay, that's a, you know, a good question to clarify because it's critical. So, here. Okay, so the act, the act is a great question because there's a, a debate in the Talmud just on that question about whether the mitzvah is blowing or hearing. And the debate ends with it being the mitzvah is to hear. The reason why... Um, un understandable, well, if they could just blow, right? But remember, women are not obligated in the blowing of shofar, right? They're not obligated in the hearing or the blowing. So to get to the hearing, you have to blow. So they're not obligated. And it's a mitzvah ase she uh, shezman grama. And because it's in that category, they're not obligated. And because, as I said, People who are not obligated cannot fulfill the mitzvah for people that are obligated. So yes, the mitzvah is to hear shofar, uh, but that is actually a very, a very good point. Um, any other questions? Okay, what I wanted to say, I mean, we have a final question and I, I wanted to say a couple things um, about this. Um, and, you know, um, I'm getting a question, I'm sorry. It seems contradictory to relate women's cries of childbirth, which is a time frame to it, and yet the time frame for shofar, which isn't exactly to the minute timed either, that women are then prohibited from making the sounds due to time constrictions. So women are allowed to blow shofar for women, 
that is not, they can blow shofar for women, it's not problematic. If they wanted to blow shofar for themselves and for other women, they can. What we do run into is this concern over separating from the tzibor um, and not being part of the tzibor. And so how do you balance both of those is a, is a very important um, piece. I hope that helps answer the question. I'm not sure, but that that is the, you know, that is that those are the competing issues. Um, okay. I want to also just make a comment uh, because women took this obligation upon themselves. You've seen the Mishnah Bura talk about it, um, calling it a Ketzat Mitzvah, Yesh Lahem Um In fact, the Shulchan Aruch, and we said this before, I read it before, number 16, when he said, asher, she, number six, and I'm, I'm, I'll say it in English, so too a man after he's, ob, he's fulfilled his obligation already is able to blow shofar for the women to fulfill their obligations. They use, he uses the word lahotzian, which is a sort of a strong word for uh, a man who's trying to help women fulfill the obligation when they don't really have an obligation. So to use a lahotzian, that he can be hotzian, it's, a, it's very interesting. Um, in fact, um, we notice that um, throughout the post camp, support women's practice in the value of women blowing shofar. And if you look, for example, at source number 19, um, Rav Moshe Feinstein, he writes in a, in a, in a question, in a response, uh, our practice in any case is to bring Lulav to the women from the Beit Knesset to their homes, even in a place where there is no Eruv. So too we bring the Shofar from the Beit Knesset to women who are, who are ill to blow for them. So the competing value may be, well, they're not obligated and would be there at Sorach to carry a Shofar and Yontif to blow for women. And Rav Moshe Feinstein says, yes, you take it. This value is important that they get to hear Shofar. Rabbi Vladya Yosef in the next um, source talks about um, women who, and we'll just read it from the top, a woman, uh, source number 20, who has gone to hear the Shofar in Rosh Hashanah for many years, and now she's not able to do it because of sickness or pregnancy or something else. She does not want to have to go anymore, even in future years. She must nullify this practice entirely. She must do Hatarat Nadarim, and she must express regret for not doing it. Blineder. However, if just if just this year it happens that she's not able to uphold the commandment of Shofar, and the next year she intends to return to this good practice of going to the Beit Knesset or Shofar, she does not need to do Hatarat. Okay. So in fact, if you decide that you're not going to blow Shofar, you must annul the vow of doing of blowing Shofar. Okay, so um, so right now, just to summarize, we're just to to, to, to understand this. Um, uh, we have uh, decided that women can blow shofar for women, um, and that the uh, post scheme are recognizing the complexity in the halakhic, halakhic status of women's roles in shofar and see the value of this mitzvah and fulfilling this mitzvah over, over other concerns um, and support women um, women's taking on this mitzvah and the dedication to doing this mitzvah. I want to stop for a second and see if there's any questions or clarifications um, that that I may that people may have. Uh, Carmela, one question that uh, came in was whether you know what the minhag is um, in other communities that are neither Ashkenaz uh, nor Sephardi, like Romanite Jews, um, the Italian Jews, or Ethiopian Jews. I think that's a great question. I do not know what the uh, practice is in uh, other communities. We could uh, try to do some. We could look that up, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions or things that aren't clear to anyone? Please just uh, type it into the question slot or into the chat slot, and uh, 
kind of translate that question directly to Carmela. Um, nothing yet, but if something comes up, okay. I'll let you know. Okay, great. I want to talk about the final question that um, Alyssa raises in her um, in her article. Can a woman blow in the month of Elul? Now, blowing in the month of Elul um, is a minhag. It is custom. Um, and we see in uh, the tour that this is to bring the community to Chuba. It is a communal custom that is done after um, the morning services. Um, and certainly, uh, there really is no reason why, uh, if you look at it from the perspective of what we've been talking about, as there is no obligation, right? There's no, as, because it's a minhag, there's no, um, uh, it's not an obligation, it's not a Torah obligation, uh, per se, to blow shofar in a lul. So there is room there, um, and in fact, because it needs to be done in the community, there might be reason for uh, women to blow shofar in a women's tefillah setting, um, and even in shul. Uh, certainly in those synagogues where women take on leadership positions, where it's customary for women to speak, uh, perhaps, you know, give right, give right Torah, speak uh, in the shul, and... Um, where, it is, where it is customary for, for women to take those kinds of roles on, they can certainly blow shofar in a lul, and it's certainly been done um, in many shuls where women uh, blow shofar um, in a lul. Um, the only thing, some of the concerns that do come up, is that we want to be very clear that, uh, well, if women are blowing shofar in a lul, that people who come to the shul or who are part or members of the shul realize that that is not going to, you know, that woman would not, or that person may or may not be blowing shofar um, on uh, Rosh Hashanah, that women don't blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah so that there won't be a confusion um, for that. Um, now, there is, there are some communities and some reason to believe also that, um, and we see this in the responses uh, in, in some of the discussion about this minhag, there may be uh, the term takana related to it, and we see this in, I think, the tour and the Shulchan Aruch, and it's brought down by um, the Tzitz Eliezer who talks about it. So some com communities, depending on how they understand takana, may take exception to that and may be more careful or, or may, may not want women to blow shofar in a lull, and I'm just saying that to be complete. But in general, um, this is seen as a minhag, um, and women should be able to blow in a lull. Questions? Okay, so a few questions. Um, one, um, one question is whether it makes a difference what the source of the show for blowing for For example, if a machine is blowing by a I guess that it be done by a, a live person. So my understanding is it needs to be done by a live person. Is that is that an Elul? I would imagine that's an Elul. Uh, no, this question was a general question. So I guess So I certainly in Rosh Hashanah, it, it would have to be done. The person has to blow the shofar. Um, and the minhag is to blow in Elul. Um, I'm not, you know, that is my answer. Um, I'm not, you know, I haven't seen anything that says a machine can blow. Um, um, another woman asks a question that goes back to sort of the initial point that you made that sort of at the core of why women cannot blow shofar for men is that women are exempt from the mitzvah hasseisha's mantra. Not. They're exempt from the time-bound commandments. So far from that. But um, this question is: responsibilities. Therefore, why would she still be bound uh, um, to this notion of, of being exempt from time-bound commandments? I think that's the question. If she doesn't have home home responsibilities, exactly. If we're in a day, particularly I guess in our modern era, where 
there might be other um, other opportunities for the woman to release herself from her time bound commitments, or perhaps she's a woman who does not have home responsibilities. Why would we? Why why would we continue to have her status be different um, in regarding to the so, and I think that's really a fair question. I think the answer is it's a hard it's a hard uh, it's a hard question to answer. Clearly, we did not have a women's voice in the Talmud there to to you know. Also, I wonder how long women actually lived um, if they actually made it past childbearing age. Um, you know, uh, it's true that uh, women's obligations do change, um, but the fact is her status hasn't changed on a halachic level. And so she is still, you know, the obligation is not equivalent to a man's obligation in this. She's taken upon the obligation, she has sat mitzvah, she has an obligation, but it is not equivalent. And in Jewish law, we have differences in uh, obligation levels of, of doing certain mitzvot, and we base our decisions about who can perform those mitzvot for others based on those levels of obligations. But I think it's a fair question. Um, and, you know, look, I think there's, I think that, that we have to perhaps find um, some creative ways to uh, think about this further, um, you know, about what can be done. I know one shul uh, in particular has um, women calling out, is a makriya, they call out the shofar sounds. Um, that may be something that can be done on Rosh Hashanah. Um, so that's one thought. Uh, so another question that just came up. Um, was an out-of-the-box question, um, self-described, and the question was, are there any sources about people who are intersex blowing the shofar, particularly around the question of blowing the shofar for men? Um, okay, on. so we actually do have a source here. I think that's a fair question. So did you say a transsexual? I'm sorry. The word was intersex, but I think it's in the source about the the... Um, the the Mitzum Tam and the androgynous. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Source 17, actually. Right. So I'm going to look at that right now with the group. Um, it's number 17. A Tum Tam, a Tum Tum, which is a person who's, um, it's unclear genitalia, and an androgynous cannot blow shofar to fulfill the obligation of men, lest they're actually female. For as we know, a woman is not able to fulfill the obligation of a man. So the answer is they would not be able to fulfill the obligation for a man because they actually might be female. Um, so um, on the same question, back to uh, the Mitzvah Seishas Man Grama, the time bound restrictions. Um, uh, Lori wants to know how many of these are actually Torah halacha and how many are minhag by the rabbi? Okay, wonderful. I actually really appreciate that question. So let's break down the show for blowing on Rosh Hashanah. And, um, and I'm actually uh, going to uh, talk about this uh, based on uh, Rabbi Dan uh, Daniel Sperber's uh, 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 halachic uh, viewpoint on this. Um, so, so we're required to hear 9 slash 10. The problem is, because nobody knew what Truah was, that became 30. Um, then the Talmud also, the Talmud asks us to do two sets. So the Talmud asks us to do 30 times 2, which is 60. And the Talmud in Rosh Hashanah says that we need to do shofar blowing as well in uh, during Musaf, during Machia, Zichronot, and Shofar Rose. Uh, so there you have your 60. You have 30 blows that are tikiot miyusha that you do right after Kriyat Torah, after the Torah service. There's 30 um, uh, blasts then. And there are 30 blasts, depending on who you hold by, um, you know, we actually hold um, by um, the, uh, 
the viewpoint, if you hold by the viewpoint that you do 30 there, 30 in Musaf, and then 40 afterwards, Rabbi Sperber sees those first 60, the ones that are done at Torah blowing, after Torah laning, and the ones that, that are done during Musaf, as Midorai to Midrabanan, and he sees those 40 as symbolic. Um, and so, for example, uh, the partnership in Yandar Chinoam actually allows women to blow um, 40, um, those 40 uh, blasts um, in, during Rosh Hashanah, in Shul, you know, during their service. Um, I just want to say also that uh, for those that hold that you do 30 after Torah laning, 30 during... Um, the silent Amidah of Musaf, 30 at Chazarat and Shasat just leaves you 10, and then you, that, those 10 might be the symbolic 10. Um, so in communities uh, where Kavod HaTzibor um, has, you know, um, has been dealt with or, or thought of differently, um, there might be room for, uh, in partnership minion, uh, in communities that accept this, um, and of course, you know, um, Rabbi Sperber is, um, you know, a giant in halacha. So uh, um, there's reason to believe that there that there may be a place for women on Rosh Hashanah to blow shofar in certain communities where it's accepted. Um, it's certainly not the mainstream. Does that help answer uh, the question? Um. I think so. I think that there there's kind of two two big questions. Right? One is the broader question about um, the mitzvot asayshas man grama, and you know I think that 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 question about which ones are Torah and which ones are minhag is a really complicated um, and probably beyond the scope of this webinar to talk about all the various ways we understand the difference between. Um, permissible but not obligated or prohibited and, and the ways all of those intersect um, in how halacha is decided and how public policy in our communities um, evaluate that. At the same time, I think what Carmela is sharing specifically about shofar is that the shofar, the amount that we have to hear mida oraita from the Torah of uh, of shofar blast is not entirely clear, and at least in the case of the Darchinoam community, they have a tshuva that says that uh, only 60 of them have that level of obligation, and therefore men, in order to be have their obligation fulfilled, must hear the shofar done by men. Women can have their obligations for those 60 and any others, either by men or for women. So the communal practice is to have a man blow those, uh, blow those 60. In their community, there's this question about the last 40, and uh, they do have a woman blow shofar for those last 40. I will say, um, we reached out to the community just to get some of their uh, kind of input on how they made this decision, and uh, that they, they do, they have discussed at great lengths with their community that, um, that this is about the 60 and the 40. They're very clear to make sure everybody understands that there isn't uh, uh, the possibility that some people will think, oh, if she can blow the last 40, she can blow all 100. They make announcements to that effect that if anybody missed the first 60, um, um, they need to hear them all again, and they do have somebody, um, a man, do them again at the end, all hundred. So they are they are kind of looking to make sure that you know, Carmel, the point you raised earlier around making sure that we don't confuse anybody. Let's say in the Elul case, in their community, they too are are similarly being very explicit about where their halachic decision making came from, particularly on that last. That's very any, interesting. Any other questions from people out there? Um, either the, or the question function or there's the chat function. Um, you know, one thing I would add is uh, to the question, 
Carmel, if you don't mind, um, sort of the practical examples of what women can do in terms of blowing shofar. And I think you've mentioned a number of them. Um, but if, if you don't mind, I'll summarize them. Yes, please. Um, so, of course, now that we understand that women are allowed to blow shofar, that they can, um, they can um, include, they, they are able to be yotze, they can, um, their blowing of the shofar allows other women to fulfill their halakhic uh, obligations. So certainly women then who know how to blow shofar in the correct way can blow for homebound women. They can visit the example, Carmela, you mentioned, they can visit the, the local um, hospital and blow for women there. They can blow for their family members or their uh, friends in their community who may be home with a baby or for some other reason. Um, two, and we can teach bar and bat mitzvah students to learn how to blow shofar. That's certainly a wonderful thing that, that women can do with their knowledge. Three, you mentioned this as well, Carmela. A woman can call out the blast. She can be makri for the person who is blowing and in that way participate communally in the, um, in, in the halacha. And four, they can organize the blowing of the shofar for women who may have missed it. And five, finally, as you said, they could blow um, the, the shofar in the case of Elul where it's mostly Eminhaz. So those are five practical uh, suggestions, and Jopa has those listed um, at the end of the Halakhic article on our website um, about the, the shofar blowing, broadly, broadly speaking. Erin just gave us that page. That's great. And I just wanted to add um, another opportunity um, that I saw today. I was invited to a workshop at a synagogue in New Jersey and uh, to teach women how to blow shofar, but who came to the workshop were families, fathers and, um, and mo mothers and their kids, boys and girls, with their shofars. And it was really beautiful to hear as a family uh, fa the learning how to blow shofar. Um, so uh, that is something that, you know, I think Jofa could also perhaps sponsor these events in other communities. Um, and it, it was, it, to me, it was very meaningful um, for uh, everybody to, um, you know, from even, you know, we talk about minors and children learning. This is a great opportunity from a very young age to uh, be very comfortable with blowing shofar and learning what all this sounds are supposed to be and what the meanings are and, and to really own this mitzvah, which is actually, you know, as we all, we all go to, to show, we want to hear show parts. Um, for many people, very moving part of the service. So thank you. Any final questions from the group? So I don't see any final questions. Um, so I think with that note, I just want to thank Carmela really for putting so much time and energy into learning these sources, into thinking um, really deeply about what they mean and what their meaning is for us today and for sharing that with us. Uh, thank you to all of you who have attended and joined us and uh, listened and asked your questions. Uh, please feel free if you have any questions, you know, shoot them over to Jofa. Um, this webinar was recorded and we will be sharing it. And again, the Shofar Guide is on our website if you want to read an article kind of that goes into a bit more detail on that. Um, in general, uh, the jofa.org website has tremendous resources, not just on Shofar and Rosh Hashanah, but on many, many, many um, aspects of halakha and Jewish life. And we encourage you to visit um, often and, um, and uh, take advantage of those resources and join us for, uh, for future webinars. Um, and with that, thank you, Carmela. Um, thank you. Shana Tova to everybody.